feels like Scientific American is uh, vying for uh, to be the disseminator of the worst public health advice. I, you know, they're not going to make it. Not with the CDC out there and the WHO and, you know, the NIH and, uh, and all of the governments. But right? they make a strong showing. But they're making a really strong showing these days. Yeah. And there's, there's been a lot. There's been a lot. So um, here's just one more okay. thing from okay. Scientific American. Um, so, you know, they got big shoes to fill. I'm sorry, guys. I don't, I don't think you're going to get to worst public health advice. Um, but uh, here's, here's a tweet, and then we'll show you the, the article afterwards. Um, a tweet about a Scientific American article. The quote tweet is, Fed is best. An excellent essay for Scientific American about the mental toll of pushing exclusive breastfeeding and what the evidence really says. So fed is best is a code, which I hadn't run into before, for no, 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 not breast is best, which is the phrase that has been pushed by things like the La Leche League and, uh, and the American Association of Pediatrics and, you know, all normal human beings ever. Um, and, you know, instead of breast is best, now we got fed is best. Uh, and boy, they're good. That's the marketing department again, right? That's the marketing department. You don't want your baby to starve. Are you telling me my baby should starve? Okay, guys. No. However, what the article does, let's see, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, here's some of what the article this week published in Scientific American so called an opinion piece on public health, it's okay not to breastfeed. Exclusive breastfeeding is not imperative, and the breast is best mantra can be harmful to babies and parents, wait for it, especially among marginalized people. Goodness. Of course they did. Yeah. Yes, of course they did. Okay, let's just share a few things from this piece of work. To reinforce that breast is best for babies and that formula feeding is inferior, in 2022, the American Academy of Pediatrics affirmed its decades-long stance in favor of exclusive breastfeeding meaning nothing but breast milk, arguing for this in the arguing for this, excuse of breastfeeding in the first six months, and calling breastfeeding and human milk normative and a public health imperative. They put breastfeeding being normative in quotes. Mm. Normative means it's the norm. The editor in chief of Scientific American has already demonstrated that she doesn't understand what sex is and therefore really anything about what you know mammals or vertebrates or evolution is so maybe this is just in keeping but what well i'm wondering normative in this case i think means morally required which it would be oh i okay i may maybe i th I, th I think i yeah, I mean, the problem is this is now a term with two meanings, right? You've okay. got normative. Okay, if it's got two meanings, whatever, there's, pl there's plenty to argue with in this piece. I thought it, I thought it uh, absurd that they put it in quotes. Right. Um, but, okay. Um, at the same time, adoptive and other parents who can't provide human milk or choose not to feel ashamed. There are cases where... Um, women who gestated their own babies actually can't produce milk. Yep. And there are adoptive parents who can't produce milk. And no, they shouldn't feel shamed for not being able to do something that they cannot do. But built into the sentence is who can't or choose not to. They should feel shamed. Like th this is actually, this is absolutely best for for babies. This is absolutely best. And if you are making a choice because you don't feel like providing your child with the thing that, gosh, how old are mammals? 180 million years, something like that. 180 million years of evolution. For 180 million years, mammal mothers have been feeding their newborns Breast milk. Human cultures vary in terms of how long the period of exclusive breastfeeding lasts uh, and how long breastfeeding lasts at all. And in some cultures, babies begin to be fed some of the adult diet pretty soon, pretty quickly. But there is no single human culture out there 
that says, eh, maybe just don't do that at all. No single human culture. We've got, and I think that number's about right, something, something around 180 million years of, of mammal evolution in which one of the, I mean, in fact, you know, one of the key innovations that made, that make, that made mammals mammals and then became successful, there are a lot of them. We're endothermic, we have hair, you know, all these things, but we're like literally our eponymous trait, the trait for which we are named is the mammary glands um, that allows for obligate, obligate maternal care. And from that, you then get a positive feedback in which you get more and more parental care. And then you get biparental care. And you get all sorts of long, of, of benefits of the long childhoods that result from parental care. All of that is downstream of breastfeeding. All of it. And when I say breastfeeding this time, I'm talking about breastfeeding across all of mammals, across the entire 180 million year history. And it's now over because Scientific American has decided... Because Scientific American is being run by anti-scientific idiots. That's um, it. So uh, I want to jump in here. Maybe mm -hmm. you're not done. I'm not, but go on. Um, the, the, the thing about this story is, let's say there's a harm shaming people who do not breastfeed. Let's say that that's a real thing, okay? It's pretty unlikely, right? Anybody who can breastfeed and doesn't might be shamed. That may make sense. Anybody who can't is not going to be shamed by anybody because they didn't have a choice. No, I, I, so I think the history here, and there's a bunch in this article that I'm not reading out loud, and, I, and I've run into these stories before, but there is, there is a growing vocal contingent of women who say, and in fact, this is... Um, let me just finish reading because I think I think you're okay. jumping in on something that that you're not as informed about, but I but I don't think it means what they think it means. Okay. So uh, again, from this article, uh, some studies show that everything from breast surgery to polycystic ovarian syndrome to diabetes to chronic stress and far more can disrupt lactation, and together these conditions affect far more than one in ten birthing folks. So first of all, no women, um, but. Breast surgery, okay, sometimes breast surgery will have been necessary to remove cancers, but but usually women of childbearing age who have breast surgery, that's not a, a, a cancer surgery. That's a that's a, a surgery that they chose to get, either to make their breasts larger or smaller. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, diabetes, chronic stress, and more. All of these are diseases or situations of modernity. These are all problems of the modern condition, many of which can be mitigated or disappeared by getting rid of some of the things like, oh, all the crap and processed food that isn't salt, right? Like all the rest of the things that people are filling their bodies with that are making them sick and giving them things like diabetes and their days are filled with abhorrent tasks and so they have chronic stress. And then... You know, women give birth and they, they live a life and they have to, you know, get back to work. And maybe it is a little bit hard. Maybe it's a lot hard. But it's working. But it's hard. And it doesn't feel like the fairy tales told them it would feel. And in a moment of what they perceive as weakness, they give their baby a little bit of formula. And it feels like that baby is a little bit better satiated. And they start doing it more and more. And the more the baby is getting the formula, the less their breasts are producing, and it's positive feedback, and it ends pretty quickly, and then they don't have any choice anymore. So that is something that I think a lot of women are experiencing. And instead of us collectively saying, okay, how do we, and, and La Leche League and the American Association of Pediatrics have been on the right side of this, right? Like, how do we help you figure out how to successfully breastfeed your child? Instead, there is this increasingly powerful movement, this pushback that says, no, 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 don't shame us. We get to do what we want to do. And if that doesn't include breastfeeding, well, that's not your, that's no, no business of yours, except, except it is. And I'll say a little bit more about why, but just a few more um, quotes from this article here. The reliance on breastfeeding can also lead to a violation of children's right to be satiated. <laughs> okay. 
And <clears throat> oh man, mm-hmm. yeah, they're good. That's, a, that's the marketing department for you, right it. there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. Think about all Children's of the right to be safe. Think about all of the species in which the offspring are suffering from the violation of this right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I, at the moment, am thirsty, and I can't find the water glass sitting in front of me, and I have a right to be quenched, and I need you to get me a diet coke. Right. Because that's what that, I need to yep. have my thirst quench. I've literally never drunk a Diet Coke and I never will. But if I say that, yep. you, Mr. Producer Son, are violating my right to have my thirst quenched if you don't bring me the toxin of my choice. It's a rights violation. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 EBF, again, they've turned it into an acronym, exclusive breastfeeding, is not Mother Nature's design. Excuse me? Caregivers have fed infant substances in addition to or instead of their own birth parents milk and in many cultures for a slew of reasons, including milk supply taking a few days to come in and personal preference. These alternatives included milk from human wet nurses and animal milk. So th- this is this postmodern error where like there have been a few exceptions in modern times and all we have to do is point to those couple exceptions and say, see, all... All bets are off. There is no history. We don't actually believe in evolution because obviously the people who are manning the science TM store don't believe in evolution. They're the people who claim to be on the side of science and who claim that it's the right wingers, the conservatives, the religious folk who don't believe in evolution. And some of them don't. But these people clearly don't either. It's the tyranny. Clearly don't. It's the tyranny of the edge case. The tyranny of the edge case. I like that. Yes, I like that very much. Okay, I'm I'm done with quotes from the article. Um, It's obviously insane. Uh, I thought that I would, as a rejoinder, share a little. It's this is related. Oh, it's related. Yes. All right. As a rejoinder, um, share a little bit from this book that I like. It's a hunter gatherer's guide to the 21st century. It's our book from 2021. Um, And from chapter three, we uh, in chapter three. We talk about things like the appendix and the hygiene hypothesis. And here's a, just one page from chapter three called Ancient Bodies, Modern World. Thus, so this follows a long discussion of what appendicitis is. Thus, appendicitis is a disorder of the weird world. So too are many allergies and autoimmune disorders for which there is solid and growing evidence to support the hygiene hypothesis. The hygiene hypothesis posits that because we live in ever cleaner surroundings and are therefore exposed to ever fewer microorganisms, our immune systems are inadequately prepared and so develop regulatory problems, such as allergies, autoimmune disorders, and perhaps even some cancers. Our immune systems are not functioning as they evolved to do, suggests the hygiene hygiene hypothesis, because we have cleansed our environments too thoroughly. Our appendix seems likely to have suffered the same fate as our immune systems. Absent frequent bouts of diarrhea, which are the body's way of ridding itself of pathogenic gut bacteria, the appendix turns from being an important repository of good bacteria to being a liability. There is an important parable to be invoked here, Chesterton's fence, named for turn of the 20th century philosopher and writer G.K. Chesterton, the man who first described it. Chesterton's fence urges caution in making changes to systems that are not fully understood. It is thus a concept related to the precautionary principle. Chesterton wrote this of a fence or gate erected across a road, quote, The more modern type of reformer goes gaily up to it and says, I don't see the use of this. Let us clear it away. To which the more intelligent type of reformer will do well to answer, quote, if you don't see the use of it, I certainly won't let you clear it away. Go away and think. Then when you can come back and tell me that you do see the use of it, I may allow you to destroy it. End quote. Chesterton wrote this in the same era when some medical doctors had decided that the large intestine was a waste of space in the human body. Another story we explore earlier in this chapter. If Chesterton's fence suggests that a fence should not be removed until you have discovered something of its function, the appendix and large intestine might be called Chesterton's organs. Keep an eye out for other things that are... Sorry. Keep an eye out for other things that we moderns might be trying to rid ourselves of without sufficiently understanding their function. Not only Chesterton's organs, but his gods and his breast milk, his cuisine, and his play. And these are the sorts of things we talk about throughout this book. Chesterton's religion, Chesterton's breast milk, Chesterton's play, Chesterton's foods. So one more quote from this book at the very end of the Parenthood and Relationship chapter. 
many of these chapters we have what we call the corrective lens. So, you know, actionable things that you can do to help you escape from the hyper novelty of the modern world and uh, understand your life through an with an evolutionary lens. And so this, the last corrective lens item in the chapter Parenthood and Relationship is breastfeed your infants if you can. Adults who were breastfed have better formed palates and better aligned teeth compared to those who were bottle fed. And breast milk has in it all manner of nutrients and information that we do not understand. It may, for instance, contain cues with which the infant entrains his sleep-wake cycle. Thus, if you do breastfeed and also pump milk to feed the baby at other times, feeding your baby milk that was pumped at the same time of day as it currently is could be helpful in getting your baby to sleep when you want him to. But another way, again, beware Chesterton's breast milk. So there's all sorts of research to support all of the health benefits that we so far know with breast milk, but there's also this new thing that we put into there, which was uh, a hypothesis put forward by a student of ours, Josie Jarvis, uh, that there might be circadian cues in breast milk that would, as we write there, help entrain the baby to the same sleep-wake cycle as the mother. There's no way formula is going to do that for you. So everything from palate and oral cavity shape to immune function to lower allergies to actually maybe having a sleep-wake cycle in your infant that is more like your own, breast is best, Scientific American is wrong, again. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that I want to I want to add in here. Uh, I. Uh, I don't know where to start, but I know. this is a story that mirrors so many other stories that we've been hearing, yep. right? So, you know, is there a problem uh, of trans people being excluded? Yes. Well, we should include them. Okay. We should include them everywhere, including sports. Uh, okay, but now you've caused a new, much larger harm. You may have addressed an actual problem of a small size, and you have created a huge problem, and you are refusing to look at it. So in this case, you've got babies who have a right to have whatever is best from the point of view of their development, and that could be best from a hundred different perspectives. No, no, they only have the right to be satiated. <laughs> this does go back to exactly what we say in the book, where mm -hmm. because breast milk contains nutrition, we initially mistook it for food when it's actually food and many other things simultaneously. It's immunological information, uh, it's circadian information potentially. So in, in any yes, case, the baby, that's exactly right. the baby has a right to whatever is best. They cannot express that right. Their parent is supposed to be the one who is working in the baby's best interest, and Scientific American is now actively misinforming that parent, right? This is, again, a question of informed consent. The parent has a right to know what it is that breast milk does for the baby in order that they can make a choice. And by misinforming that parent, that parent may consent to something that is not in the child's interest, thinking that they are doing something that is in the child's interest. That is an absurdity. Yep. I would also point out that there is an obvious hazard to offloading the production of nutrition to manufacturers, right? Which is that the manufacturer's incentive is not to produce a baby who will live the longest or mature the healthiest or be the most resistant to disease or any of those things. The manufacturer gets a positive signal that they are doing what's right when the stuff moves off the shelves. But also, but also, and one of the one of the things in this piece that I didn't share is that, you know, anyone who's been a parent in the weird world, at least in America of late, and hasn't completely eschewed the, the allopathic medical world, um, has been, you know, has had forced on them all the metrics. Well, your baby was, you know, born at this weight, and that's the 24th percentile. Oh, at the next check-in. Oh, your baby's the 28th percentile. Oh, your baby's at the 57th percentile. Yay! We know that higher percentile numbers are better. Well, but when they're adults, we don't want them at the highest percentile of weight, do we? No, because we got this obesity epidemic. But early on, you go in for all these checkups and you're like, and they, they give you these graphs every time. Like, look at, look at your child's progress compared to the mean. 
And you are led to believe, even if you know you should not, that what you're looking for is a high rate of growth and to be above the average because you definitely want your child to be above average, don't you? And what a formula producer can do to help you get your kid to a place where you can brag to your neighbors about him is put lots and lots of calories in there that cause fast growth and not much else. Not only that, not only, but they will automatically do this, even if they don't know what they're doing. The market will lead them to produce formula that causes increased demand for formula. So what you're doing is you're taking a dynamic system between mother and infant, where both parties, they are not in perfect agreement about how much to dispense, but they are in overwhelming agreement because they both do best if the baby lives a long time and in a healthy way, right? So that system is built to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. A system in which a manufacturer is successful is doing its fiduciary job with respect to its shareholders mm -hmm. if the baby consumes more formula than it should, therefore creating a developmental pattern that may well predispose it to obesity later in life. In fact, I wonder if anyone has just simply asked the question, what is the relationship between breastfeeding in childhood and obesity later in life? And I'll bet it's a negative I, I relationship. Believe, um, I believe that there is some research on this. I don't remember how abundant it is, but uh, indeed the pattern um, shows what you would expect. Yeah. Uh, that breastfeeding is mitigating against at least childhood obesity. I, I think maybe the research doesn't go into adulthood. But then think about the absurdity. I mean, it is absurd enough on its face that they would claim that the child has a right to be sated, right? But the absurdity, if that right to be sated is actually is a cloak that covers the manufacturer's right to turn that into an obese adult, right? Which is potentially there, right? That is a that is a diabolical inversion of reality. It is. And the, I mean, this is just so obvious. And to have Scientific American broadcasting an obvious on its head conclusion in an effort to protect some people who may exist from shame that might be directed at them. No, no, while, that, that, that does happen. Well, no. I don't think anybody is shaming a mother who can't produce milk for not feeding milk, right? I, no, I, I, sus I suspect it is because uh, I, sus I suspect that is happening because, um, it, you know, and this may actually be a bit analogous to the trans situation, right? Uh, that there are very rare mothers who gestated their own children uh, who find that they cannot produce milk for those children. And the... I believe that the vast majority of people who are saying, this is horrifying, I don't want to have to breastfeed my child, I am not a, a, the milk machine, that's not what I have to do, uh, are not in that category. Right. Uh, so many people who are you know, breastfeeding advocates uh, will look at this and, and see in everyone they run into who is not breastfeeding, those who are making a choice, whereas some people uh, are, are not. Well, I, I believe we agree. It would be a very tiny number of women who have produced their own children who are incapable of breastfeeding. And then there are going to be some other people who... Absent other um, pathogenic concerns that might be more common now than they used to be because of the toxicity of our modern environment. Sure. And there are going to be lots of people who have adopted children who can't right. breastfeed them. Of course. Um, or, you know, gay couples, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. the point is nobody on earth is arguing that in the case that you can't breastfeed, that you shouldn't feed the child something. Right? <laughs> Literally nobody is arguing that, right? Literally nobody. Literally nobody. Yeah, right? they're, they're good at the straw men, though. <laughs> yeah, <for> that one, <laughs> it's not even real straw. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's turtle killing straw is what they've used there. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but anyway, the point is, you've got some problem that amounts to some shame which may be misdirected in some cases. Mm-hmm. And then you've got a bunch of people who are hungry for a rationalization because yes. there's a convenience issue here. Mm -hmm. And then you have a question of, don't you have an obligation to give the information to all parties, even if there's a little bit of shame that is misplaced here? The point is, isn't the greater good served by everybody having the exact right information? Hey, guess what? I can't breastfeed my baby. That means I'm feeding them something else. 
What problems does that open up? Ah, could open up an obesity problem. Maybe I ought to be extra vigilant and I ought to maybe look for a manufacturer that's sensitive to this and has taken some sort of corrective action, right? Mm -hmm. So the point is by denying information, what you get is ill health and ill logic spreading in an epidemic fashion. Right. And I'm sure the people who are now spearheading this Fed is best campaign would argue that they are the ones countering the misinformation, mm. as it were, uh, and and doing right by all of those babies who are otherwise going to go hungry. Yeah. Well, I think the, the editor-in-chief who we uh, talked about a little bit last week. Yes, we did. Um, uh, we should nominate her for misinformation. Mm. Um, and I would love to see a Scientific American cover with her on it, but the title changed in camel case to Unscientific American. I would love to see that produced. Next question is just a comment. Magazine cover incoming. Here it is, Zachary. Show my screen. <clears throat> I saw it separately somewhere. This is Unscientific American. We're getting there, but we need the you camel case. You want we the need... camel case. U, S, and A all um, capitalized. Yeah, and that doesn't... They're doing it in all caps, which is what I tricked. Scientific American has that in their coverage. They do. So what you actually want is... I know what you want. I can create it later. All right. Fed is, be fed is best. Breastfeeding can be harmful to marginalized people. COVID vaccines show no signs of harming fertility or sexual function. That's excellent. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, good work. Yeah, okay, I'm going to like that. Thank you.